Hello and welcome. I'm Vivian Schmidt. I'm director of the Center for the Study of Europe here at Boston University, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of my center, as well as the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy, to this event. Uh, we're delighted to be able to introduce a panel of ambassadors and Alan Berger, and I'll be introducing them in a minute, um, uh, to talk about the EU. Uh, this is in, under the auspices of a grant that we've received from the EU Commission delegation in Washington. Uh, EU Inside Out, which is a series uh, that will go for the next year and a half, in which we will have both ambassadors inside and from the outside, we will have writers and artists coming to speak at BU. And we actually last week had the first of our artists, uh, writers, uh, who's Coim Tobin, an Irish writer, um, which was a great success. So, of course, today will be an equally great success. So I'm delighted to introduce first Ambassador Joao Valle de Almeida, who's head of the delegation of the European Union to the United States since August 10th, 2010. Prior to his appointment in Washington as the European Union's ambassador, he served as the Director General for External Relations at the European Commission, the European Union's executive body. As the most senior official under the authority of the High Representative Vice President Baroness Ashton, he helped formulate and execute the EU's foreign policy and played a key role in preparing for the new European External Action Service, the EAS, that was introduced by the Lisbon Treaty. From 2004 to 2009, Ambassador Valle de Almeida was the head of cabinet, chief of staff, and main advisor for European Commission President uh, José Manuel Barroso. He accompanied President Barroso in all European Council, i.e. EU summit, meetings and ensured coordination with the private offices of the heads of state and governments in all 27 member states of the EU. Ambassador Valle de Almeida was also the president's personal representative for the negotiations on the Treaty of Lisbon. Ambassador Valle de Almeida joined the European Commission in 1982 at its delegation in Lisbon after spending seven years as a journalist. He holds a degree in history from the University of Lisbon and has studied and received training in journalism and management in the United States, France, Japan, and the United Kingdom. Our second ambassador, Michael Collins, became Ireland's ambassador to the United States on September 18, 2007. With a particular focus on supporting Irish business and economic development, Ambassador Collins has spoken extensively on contemporary Ireland and the Northern Ireland peace process. Prior to his Washington appointment, Ambassador Collins worked for six years as second secretary general at the Department of the Tausich, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, who's the Prime Minister of Ireland. In that capacity, he worked closely with the Tausich um, Bertie Ahern, uh, Prime Minister Blair, and the Northern Ireland political parties on the Northern Ireland peace process. During his time at the Department of the Tausich, Ambassador Collins was also responsible for European Union issues, including Ireland's EU presidency in 2004, as well as UN and international affairs. A native of Dublin, he was educated at Black Rock College and Trinity College, Dublin. He joined the Department of Foreign Affairs as a third secretary in 1974, and his early diplomatic postings brought him to Rome in 1975-77, New York, 82 to 86, and Washington, 93 to 95. Ambassador Collins served as Ireland's ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 95 to 99, during which time he also covered Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Cutter and the United Emirates. Ambassador Collins also served from 99 to 2001 as ambassador to the Czech Republic and the Ukraine. So there are two ambassadors. Our moderator, Alan Berger, has had a long career as an editorial writer on international affairs at the Glo Boston Globe, where he has done many columns that have received uh, widespread uh, interest and acclaim. He's also been awarded many prizes. So he will moderate the discussion. Each of the ambassadors will give a five to 10 minute uh, presentation, if you will. And then Alan will ask them uh, undiplomatic questions, we hope. Um, and, in, and then it will be opened up to uh, general discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so would you like to begin? With pleasure, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Vivian Schmidt. Uh, always a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your commitment to European affairs, your interest, and your insights into 
European issues are well appreciated beyond Boston. Uh, thank you all for coming, professors, students, uh, consul general, and uh, other friends from Boston. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be at Boston University, um, seeing that uh, our grant is being very well used. and. Uh, uh, so I'm also checking on taxpayers' money being well spent, uh, and this is thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's part of all what you do in the United States. We try to promote debate about Europe. We, we want to have Europe on the agenda, seeing from different angles. And I'm very happy to see that you you are involving people from the cultural uh, world into this discussion. I think that's very much welcome. I think we need to go beyond diplomats, with all respect for diplomats, and technocrats, and, and the economic dimension, and to look at the wider picture. And the wider picture is about what we have in common across the Atlantic, our values, our principles, our history, our common heritage, but also the things we want to do in the future. This should not be uh, uh, driven by the past. This should be driven by the future, but what we want to do, what we need to do, in our respective countries and what we want to do in the world. And um, that is very much how we and myself in the delegation of the European Union in Washington approach our work. We want to contribute to strengthening and deepening the transatlantic relationship on all fronts, from uh, the foreign policy and security side, where I see a lot happening uh, in recent years, if I, if I think of Libya, if I think of Syria, if I think of Iran, if I think of Mali, if I think of other areas in the world, uh, Middle East, where we are cooperating, it's very difficult to see a major difference of positions and opinions between the EU and the US. Very difficult to, difficult to identify big difference in terms of strategic interests as well. Um, we are very much aligned to a point that uh, I would say that we are unprecedentedly aligned in our positions on foreign policy, and that is a good thing. But also on the economic front, where we are confronted with our own domestic uh, uh, difficulties, to a large extent the result of the financial crisis and what came after that. We are also confronted with the solid competition from emerging economies. The world is a different place economically. And we need to react to that. We need to uh, keep on uh, contributing to more growth and better jobs in our economies. And in a globalized economy, we can do it, we can only do it in a global way. So I'm very much attached to the idea that Europe and the US can play a more important role in the globe today. And that is why we are actively pursuing this idea of a trade and investment partnership across the Atlantic. Some call it free trade area. Uh, call it what you want, it is about our economies getting closer. Uh, in doing so, uh, creating better conditions for business, uh, more jobs for our citizens, and at the same time, uh, increasing our capacity to influence uh, the world. The way the world is organized, the way the global economy is organized, the principles, the values, the rules, the standards, uh, this is all uh, income, you know, put together in this idea of a trade and investment uh, partnership. So we are very much looking forward to it. Maybe we'll have an occasion to go into more details about that. And uh, we also need to look at the global challenges. We cannot ignore climate change. We cannot ignore terrorism. We cannot ignore nuclear proliferation. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, shy away from cyber security issues as much as any other concern that as a global dimension. I can talk about energy security, I can talk about water supply, uh, food security, you name it. In today's world, uh, everything is global because the world is global. There are no national solutions for problems. So we need to keep the big picture in mind all the time. And uh, more than anybody else, the US and the EU, because again, of what we have in common, we need to work more and better together. And that, that is what we're trying to do in Washington, together with all my colleagues from the 27, soon 28 member states of the European Union. We work as a team. We try to uh, move forward the, the European agenda with our American friends. But we don't want to stay in Washington. We like very much Washington, but it's very important that we come out of the Beltway. Uh, and that's why we're here today. Uh, and yesterday, 
uh, is to engage with the local community, be it the governor, be it the business community, be it the university world, um, to convey our message, to discuss with you, to learn more from you, and to see how better uh, we can do our job, which is to strengthen the transatlantic relationship. So I'll be glad to engage in a debate, uh, to reply to whatever questions, uh, and maybe some nice questions as well, not only undiplomatic ones, <laughs> and uh, covering whatever subject you want to cover. Again, thank you for coming, and thank you for organizing this. Uh, thank you very much, Zhao. Um, uh, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, if there are any hard questions, you can direct them to Zhao. Uh, <laughs> already in the under diplomatic ones. But I have the privilege of being um, Ireland's ambassador to the United States. Uh, I've occupied that position now for some six years, and it's um, it's a wonderful privilege indeed. But it's all the more privilege uh, for uh, for Ireland in this six months period to also occupy the position of presidency of, of the, uh, the European Union. And um, so, in coming to Boston today and and, and yesterday as well. Um, you know, we, we don't need to be encouraged to come to Boston to fly the Irish flag. This is a very, very Irish town. Somebody said to be Irish uh, in America is to feel at home, and certainly to be Irish in Boston is certainly to be at home. Uh, but on an occasion like this, uh, it's an opportunity, as I say, not just to as I say, fly our own flag, uh, but to fly uh, the European flag as well. Um, you know, most of you, I think, will, will, will know that Ireland is a is a long-standing member of the European Union. In fact, last month uh, we commemorated or celebrated our 40th anniversary of membership of, of that union. We joined in 1973. So we're not, we're not newcomers to this union. We've been part of almost the very foundation of that union. We've been part of the, um, uh, among those countries who have built the union uh, to the, as, as Jao said, the 27 members, shortly to be 28 member states that it is today. Uh, so uh, just Ireland, as I say, is unambiguously, unambiguously, you know, uh, sees its position as being in the heart of, of Europe. Um, um, you know, we see our uh, the success that Ireland has enjoyed, and I come to issues to do with maybe somewhat uh, less successful, uh, more recent years uh, in, in a moment. But you know, the transformation that's taken place in Ireland uh, over the last uh, two, three, four decades has been enormous, uh, and many of you have, uh, I'm sure, will have been there uh, and to have seen that. And you know, the, uh, a great deal of that was achieved by our own resources, but a considerable amount was also achieved uh, through our membership of the European Union and through the success and the partnership that we've enjoyed uh, with our European neighbours. So it's very, very important, you know, to me just to, you know, unambiguously and, and, and clearly, you know, assert Ireland's European credentials and to travel, therefore, uh, with Zhao, uh, 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 you know, on to an occasion like this and to give expression to that in, in every um, way that we can. Um, as I say, Ireland, you know, enjoys a tremendous relationship with the United States. We say that we enjoy a, a, a um, our British neighbours say they enjoy a special relationship with the United States, but if the British enjoy a special relationship with the United States, Ireland enjoys a unique relationship with the United States. So you work out the difference. But in any event, we feel very privileged uh, to, to occupy this extraordinary, uh, for a very, very small country. Uh, but we're a country that has two hearts, really. I mean, we obviously uh, appreciate and, um, and very much celebrate, and this month of March in particular, we will be celebrating that relationship that we have with the United States. But obviously, our own neighbourhood in Europe is fundamental uh, to where Ireland lies. It's fundamental to our economy. It's fundamental to our, our politics. And you know, the issue of uh, Europe in Ireland is something that has been re re reasserted um, on many, many occasions over the last uh, 40 years. We've had several referendums, a referenda in Ireland, each of which, uh, one way or the other, has confirmed, um, uh, ultimately, uh, Ireland's uh, position in Europe. And so, therefore, uh, you know, as we move forward, we're very much at the core. We see ourselves very much at the core of this union that is still in the process of evolution. And part of that core, of course, is our membership, our shared membership with the 16 other countries of, of the euro area. Ireland is, shares the euro currency uh, with the, uh, the 16 other countries who comprise um, uh, the, the euro area. And obviously, that is obviously something that uh, is, is a key uh, core cons uh, constituency uh, within the union today and within the union that may be emerging in the future as well. Um, so the story of Ireland and Europe is one uh, which we, we proudly celebrate. But of course, you know, more recent years we've, we've had, uh, you know, uh, cause for, for some uh, considerable grief as well. Not because of Europe uh, as such, but uh, more to do with the financial crisis that uh, enveloped us uh, in 2008, and uh, which caused our economy to go into a tailspin from 2009. Uh, to 2011, such that I think in that period we lost 8 to 10% of our economy. 
uh, with considerable stress, considerable um, uh, disadvantage to, to, the, to the people of Ireland. But it is important to understand that at our back, as we have sought to negotiate and navigate our way uh, out of this uh, crisis, uh, has been uh, the Union, uh, has been our partnership, uh, uh, obviously the European Commission, the European Central Bank, uh, and the IMF. So Ireland needed the support of its external partners, not the least of which, or, or, of whom uh, was the European Union in 2010. Uh, that's a bailout process which is in the process of being uh, brought to finality. We hope to be out the other side of that uh, in the not too distant future and to be back standing on our own two economic feet before very, before very long. Um, so, I mean, the, but the story of Ireland is one, therefore, therefore of, uh, of, of considerable success in more recent years of, of, of some challenge, but facing a future which uh, is looking a lot brighter today uh, than it did uh, three or four years ago. I mean, the Ireland of three or four years ago was a very uncertain place. Uh, but I'm very, very happy uh, in the circumstances to say that you know, Ireland has definitely uh, turned a corner. Uh, we are definitely on the road to recovery uh, from having uh, experienced the collapse that I just described to you from 2008 to 2011. Ireland grew last year, we'll grow again this year and we'll grow even more strongly next year. Uh, you know, so in fact, by this time next year, we expect to be one of the two best performing economies in Europe. And that's not a boast because nobody's growing very strongly at all, so I'm not suggesting that we're going to be growing very strongly, but we're, that's, it's a matter of fact that we'll be, we'll be out there ahead and destined also, I think, in the future to be a country that will uh, emerge from this crisis uh, stronger, uh, more competitive, uh, and, and obviously uh, facing the future with uh, uh, somewhat chastened, uh, but, but knowing that Europe has been at our back and knowing that our future is, is absolutely uh, and unambiguously in the heart of that union. It's also very important to understand that you know, the issues that have arisen in Ireland uh, over uh, this period have been mainly associated with a banking crisis, mainly associated with, with a property bubble which exploded monumentally and which still has not stabilised. Uh, but there is a whole other side to our economy which has continued to function uh, reasonably well. And um, you know, our, our economy and our exports continue to have, even, even in that period of difficulty, and through, through to today have been uh, growing uh, uh, quite well. In fact, uh, I think this year Ireland will be, uh, as a country, exports something like 106% of its GDP. And obviously uh, the, the export market, obviously, which is considerably uh, of significance to us, is our own European hinterland, the 500 million people who comprise the European um, uh, free, um, uh, single market. That has been a single, one of the single greatest um, factors which have allowed Ireland to grow to the, to the extent that we've been able to do so. So I say one, the, the general narrative about Ireland has been one associated with banking and, and, and the, the chaos and the crisis associated with that, but it's really important to understand that the whole other side of the economy, which has really uh, continued to do reasonably well, and you know, with the, the upside of the downside, if I may put it like that, is that coming out of this crisis, we will be 25% more competitive uh, than we were when we started. So obviously a lot of pain associated with all of that, and I, I don't want to minimise that for one moment, uh, nor do I want to minimise the extent to which you know, we have suffered a trauma. One of the great advantages that we've had, insofar as we've had advantage in this, is that we have faced up to our responsibilities very, very early. So we really do hope that um, having experienced what we experienced, that we will have a head start in terms of coming out of this crisis uh, at the earliest possible date and be a lot the stronger uh, as a consequence. So, um, you know, for, the, for Ireland again, I'd say Europe is crucial, uh, the United States is crucial uh, to understand also that in terms of what we do in Ireland, the United States in terms of inward invest investment continues to be crucial and the pipeline there throughout the period of the crisis and indeed since uh, continues to be very strong. Cumulatively, the United States invest, or has invested something like slightly short of $200 billion in Ireland. Ireland is the second biggest recipient of US FDI in Europe, uh, or was last year. And we expect to continue to do well there for the reasons of being partly to do with our membership uh, of the European Union and access to that, uh, uh, that, that common market, pa partly to do with our, our, our euro currency, partly to do with the fact that we speak pretty good English, uh, uh, partly to do with uh, you know, our education system. Any number of factors, including our taxation system, have caused us uh, to be a very uh, key destination for uh, US inward investment in Europe. So that's very important for Ireland. It continues to be very important. Fiscally in Ireland, we have adjusted our fiscal situation such that uh, we are coming into alignment with our requirements in the euro areas, which is to be at a 3% deficit by 2015. Currently, we're at about 7.9% uh, budget deficit, which is, uh, may not seem that impressive, but bear in mind that three years ago, it was 30%. So we've come down from 30% to 7.9%, and the next two years, it'll reach 3%, and therefore, we'll be 
back in fiscal alignment again. Uh, we have a banking debt issue, which uh, is being re-engineered at the moment, even as we speak, and even overnight it's been re-engineered. And we're very, very hopeful that with all of these factors coming together, and also hopefully with the global economy beginning to grow again, and not least our European partners beginning to grow again, uh, that Ireland will be poised to be a, a, met a metaphor, uh, not a boastful one, mind you, but just a metaphor nonetheless, of a country that can, I say, with some help, uh, navigate itself through uh, an almost existential crisis and, and reach the other side and uh, perhaps be almost among the first to do so. Uh, but in all of that, as I say, Europe has been at our back and it's very, very important for us to be here today uh, to, as I say, to be side by side with our partners in the European Union and to, 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 to celebrate that relationship, which has been one of success, but of course has its own challenges as well. And I don't want to minimise the, you know, the, the, that in any relationship there are always bound to be ups and downs, but overwhelmingly uh, for Ireland, uh, our, our relationship with Europe is one that is a cause for some celebration and obviously a deep commitment to remain part of that uh, continually uh, emerging uh, phenomenon that is Europe, uh, both in its own right and for its own success, but also in terms of the role that it can play in global politics and the global economy as well. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you uh, both. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions and then um, throw this open for questions from the audience. Um, when you're asking a question, wait until somebody brings you a microphone. Uh, there'll be two people who will have them. Um, let me begin by asking about what you called a, an existential crisis. Um, it, uh, originally, the, uh, the political aim of uh, the European Union was to end uh, centuries of, of conflict uh, among the European nation states. Um, but it looks now as though the crisis of the Eurozone is creating uh, very powerful centrifugal forces, um, driving some countries away from others, creating fantastic hostility in the southern rim countries to what is basically a German insistence on austerity. Um, and then the question comes whether and you look at, at what's just happened in, in Italy. I, I couldn't explain the appeal of Beppe Grillo and that party. Nevertheless, they got a quarter of the vote. And it's a based on the premise that uh, those people who voted uh, for Beppe Grillo want to default on, on Europe's debt. Um, so the question is, um, to what extent is the uh, the demand for austerity from some members of the Eurozone creating political pressures that put the very notion of the European Union, the political union, in question. I guess this is part of the difficult question <laughs> <laughs> that is assigned to me. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let, let's, um, let's be clear about one point. Uh, what happened in the last few years is is the most difficult challenge to the European Union since it started business in the in the in the mid fifties. Um, but w what is it about? I mean, is it an existential crisis, or is it a, 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 you know a crisis that is part of life? In our lives, we've had different moments in which we were confronted with difficult choices uh, in difficult sets of situations, difficult contexts. We can think of when we were teenagers, we can think when we are, which is closer to my present situation, in a midlife and you may you know, start thinking about what we did before and you're going to do after. There are different situations in a person's life where one needs to reassess uh, uh, take stock and uh, and uh, and start again, or look at different ways of doing it. So I see it more as a, a crisis of this kind, uh, which, by definition, can only have a good effect, a good result, a positive one, because they are also an opportunity. Uh, why this crisis now? Uh, fundamentally, uh, because we have grown quite substantially in the last couple of decades. We, uh, we took uh, unprecedented steps in deepening European integration to a point that we 
incorporated in the Union major elements of national sovereignty, of which the most important example is a single currency. So countries were ready to give away their national currency in favor of a, a single currency. Uh, it's a major step in terms of integration, if not maybe the most important one in, you know, accepting to move some part of your sovereignty to a common uh, project. And these developments were, in historical terms, extremely rapid, you know. In a few years, we changed uh, centuries of uh, assumed uh, realities in, in our member states. So there was a sort of an acceleration of history in the 90s and early 2000. Uh, so that's one element that we should not forget. And one needs to question whether or not, uh, you know, public opinion and uh, uh, follow the exactly the same, the same kind of speed, the development that politicians were implementing. The second issue is uh, clearly the financial crisis of 2007-2008, which did not start in Europe, but had a major effect on Europe and impacted particularly the most vulnerable, uh, the weakest links in, in our system. It impacted particularly the euro area, the countries that shared the, the euro as a single currency, and within that area, the most vulnerable elements of it. So you have a combination of uh, internal domestic issues inside the Union, with external factors having a negative impact on it in an international context that could, have, could not have been worse. So three factors, like always when you have a crisis or when you have a perfect storm, it's the combination of many factors coming together at the same time, uh, exacerbating the, the underlying difficult situation. That's what we've had in the last couple of years. So how did we react to that? Uh, we reacted in a way that uh, uh, you know, was very much aware of the urgency. In some of the countries I've referred to, we were on the brink of bank bankruptcy. Michael referred to the extremely difficult situation in Ireland. I could refer to the extremely difficult situation in Greece or my own country, Portugal. Uh, as much as we can refer to other countries in Europe that are going through difficult times. So there was a sense of urgency. There was an enormous pressure from the markets. We had to react and act in an unprecedented way. And that's what we did. If you look at the mechanisms we have today in Europe compared to what we did not have five years ago, it's a huge difference. So Europe reacted. We, we prevented the meltdown and the bankruptcy of some of our countries. There was a lot of solidarity expressed at the European level. But we did more than that. We realized that our, some of our mechanisms, namely the euro area, the Economic and Monetary Union, was not fully equipped to deal with this kind of serious situations. So we went one step further and we said, it's not only urgency matters, or the, 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 the ESM or the funds or you know, the crisis mechanisms that were not there and we had to create. It's also the need to reform and modernize the, the mechanisms that we have today. And in the last couple of years, and sometimes in the last couple of months, because some decisions took effect very recently, we, are, we have basically revamped the euro area in a very substantial way. The euro area today is a very different animal from the one you knew two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. So urgency matters, unprecedented level of action, reform of the structures and the mechanisms uh, to make it uh, or to prevent the system to suffer in the same way if a next crisis comes. And thirdly, and maybe even more importantly, using this opportunity, crisis equals opportunity, to introduce structural reforms in our economies. 
that address the fundamental issue of competitiveness. So three types of response at the same time are bound to have an effect in our society, are bound to, uh, to disturb the known realities and balances that we were used to, uh, and are bound to create instability, are bound to create resistance, frustration, and imply sacrifices. And I come back to your question after, after this long detour to explain the context. Nothing is understandable without a good understanding of the context, particularly in this case. So today we have, we are applying all these three you know, tracks of action. We are impacting the reality. Uh, we believe that we are doing what is necessary. I believe, by the way, that we didn't have much alternative. But of course, we are creating uh, a difficult situation for some parts of our societies. And we need to recognize that, we need to respect that, and we need to keep our eye on the goals. And the goal has to be to return these economies to growth, to return these economies to a sound uh, fiscal situation, and to increase the competitiveness so that, as Michael uh, said, when the economy gets back to a positive cycle, when the world economy gets to better times, Europe will be well placed to take benefit of that. And I believe if I compare with other parts of the world, this side of the world as much as in some countries in Asia and elsewhere, I think we are doing more and faster than many others that basically share similar, identical, comparable problems and for some reason are not acting for the moment. So I have reasons to hope that when the time comes we'll be stronger and fitter and be able to reap the benefits of a new economic positive side. Can I just, uh, just address the austerity issue, if I may? Um, uh, because um, you know, it's, it's, it's the austerity thing is something that, that resonates in this country because the same argument goes on: austerity, no austerity; stimulus, no stimulus. Um, but just in the case of Ireland, uh, you know, it's just important to understand that that you know. Um, that whatever about other countries and whatever about the disposition of other countries or the ideological position about other countries in terms of austerity versus uh, non-austerity or stimulus, um, you know, Ireland didn't have too many choices. In fact, it had no choice. Uh, you know, when we uh, faced the wall in, in 2000 and late 2010, we, we were shut out of the bond market. Uh, we lost our capacity to borrow at, at a rate which was sustainable. And uh, so, therefore, we had to g get this external help. So it's not as if you know we decided ideologically that you know austerity is the way to go. You know, this is the, the route to take, uh, uh, and, and that 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 was a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a specific policy point. It was really a set of circumstances which um, which arose in Ireland, which really amounted us uh, amounted to us having uh, very very little choice in the matter. As a consequence, however, I mean, uh, where we are now, uh, we have reached um, in terms of the consolidation that's been required. Um, uh, through the bailout package uh, that, that we have been adhering to meticulously over nine uh, reports over the last three years, we have achieved a consolidation, that's the word that's generally used, but uh, of about 85%. In other words, we're 85% of the way uh, towards uh, completion of the series of measures that, that are required to get us out of uh, our predicament. Of course, a tremendous, tremendous um, uh, consequence uh, for people back at home who have been affected by this in a most, in a most uh, severe way. So I wouldn't like to minimize that at all. I mean, uh, you know, nobody uh, likes this aust austerity thing. Uh, you know, nobody has uh, sees this as a policy of, of choice. In our particular case, it was very much a, a case of, of necessity. Uh, but we, um, I say, we very much believe that we're we're very very far along the route. Uh, towards uh, you know, regaining our position in the bond market, which we hope to achieve uh, later this year or early next year and to be an early starter or an earlier achiever uh, in terms of emerging from uh, this very, very dark spot. And, um, and as a consequence, as I, and as I mentioned to you earlier on, you know, we're going to be that much more uh, competitive as well. 
And the key thing about it is, I mean, you know, Ireland hasn't been in the news recently, and that's a very, very good thing. Three years ago, it was all about Ireland. It was all about Ireland in ways that we would never have imagined could ever happen, and never have wished either that it should ever happen. It was all about, you know, the, the, the collapse of our, of, our, of, our, of our situation. But all that adjustment that's been taking place to the extent of, you know, 85% of the consolidation, the major, major uh, budget adjustment that's been required, has all been done within a broad, I'm not going to say everybody is happy because everybody is not happy. How could they be? But within uh, uh, reasonable levels of social cohesion. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not as if people like it, uh, but, but we do also live in the real world. And not only that, uh, but one of the, you know, the fine art of politics is how to solve all these equations, you know, and how to calibrate them such that you do maintain social cohesion, which is very, very important in any society, and of course is very, very important in our society as well. I think we, we do believe uh, that we have navigated our way this far. Now it gets closer, and more difficult as you get closer to the bone. The last 15% is obviously going to be very challenging. But we do believe uh, that a certain amount of credit is, 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 uh, is appropriate, uh, you know, given the, the way we have managed so far uh, to keep people more or less happy or unhappy, but in any event, more or less with us and, and preserved, while having to cut back, preserved social safety nets, safety nets within our society, uh, which are still the envy of many countries. I, I say people who have had, who have had to suffer some uh, cutbacks mightn't fully appreciate that. Uh, but our social security net is still very, very substantial, uh, way in excess of what you'll find in many, many other countries. And as I say, that level of social cohesion has been maintained, and that level of, 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 of safety net within our society has also been reasonably, preser reasonably preserved, notwithstanding you know, the, the, the very grave uh, fiscal situation that we've uh, endured for the last four years. Um, I'm going to ask another question, which is related to the first. Um, that in the light of the tremendous political pressures that are building up in this crisis, where you have real depressions in, certain, in the southern rim countries, um, and people out of work, 25% unemployment in, in Spain, 50% plus for young people, people who had been middle class dropping out of the middle class. Um, I mean, Americans you know, know something about what the depression did here. Um, and um, then, the, and, and that creates these resentments uh, from one, um, you know, one nation state to the other. In Greece, there were magazines you could see on kiosks that had uh, Angela Merkel in Nazi regalia. Um, and that came from this frustration, that the feeling that Greece is imposing this suffering, or, I mean, Germany is imposing this suffering on Greece. My question is, um, was this inevitable? That is, was it built into the original structure of the, uh, of the Eurozone um, creation? That is, you had common, um, common uh, monetary policy, but not a common fiscal policy. There were standards, nobody uh, stayed within them, um, or few did. Um, and some people, like George Soros, have said this was fated to happen, that the crisis that came uh, was the kind of thing that people who are involved in markets know will eventually always come. Uh, was there something wrong with the original design of the euro? Well, I just told you that uh, we, in implementing our reaction to the crisis, we agreed and implemented major revamping of our system, which shows that something needed to be revamped and something needed to be updated. Uh, you know, the, the nature of European integration, which is sometimes difficult to understand, is not that we start, started with the blueprint that, uh, you know, with a very clear roadmap, uh, the year 2000 used to do this, the year 2005 you do that. No, it is an incremental process by definition, in which we started in the 50s with a few ideas in mind, a few goals, very noble goals. Uh, but every time we evolve on the basis of what we have uh, achieved in the previous uh, period, if you, if you use the treaties as the, the, the illustration of the advances in European integration, if you see in each treaty, you know, more is done built upon what was achieved before that. So uh, we launched the Euro uh, with a certain design, which was the, the possible design in, in a given 
political context where people could agree on that. Uh, but I think we all knew, including those who were the fathers of the euro and the mothers, uh, that he, at one point in time, it will be an incremental process, that it will have to evolve. What happened, as I tried to describe, is that the crisis forced us to, as, uh, with a degree of urgency, to address those problems. And, uh, but uh, if you look back to history and you say, well, if you revamp the number of things, it's because it was not perfect. I have to agree with you. Uh, we don't pretend to be perfect, by the way, in the European Union. It's a, it's a human construction, so by definition, not perfect. Uh, but I think we are today in a situation in which uh, it's a much more balanced economic and monetary union. Basically, you have EMU, uh, and in fact, in its initial construction, the E was very small. The M was okay, but the E was smaller than the M. Uh, what we're doing now is enhancing the E that is, having an economic policy or a fiscal policy or a fiscal union, as we like to call it, that is, that is matching the ambition of the monetary union, where you have a single bank, a single interest policy, a single inflation uh, target, a single monetary uh, policy. But you don't have, or you didn't have, a, uh, a single fiscal economic policy with, in sometimes, not even a convergent fiscal and economic policy. In the case of some of our countries, not the case of Ireland, but the case of some of our countries that are in crisis, it was a case of divergence, it was a case of not applying the, the sound principles, not being sanctioned for it either. So a number of issues that uh, we realized we needed to change. But I, what I challenge is the idea that if it was not perfect in the, when you started, you should not have done it. No, the way we make progress in the Union is by doing what we can do at a given point in time and build on that and in an incremental way improve it. If you compare what the Union is today to what it was in 1957 when the Treaty of Rome was uh, agreed upon, uh, it's a very different Union. And most of the things that we have today were not foreseen in the Treaty of Rome as such. What was foreseen in the Treaty of Rome was a basic economic construction and the concept of a never closer union. Incremental progress on top of achievements done before. And this is the way at least I see the recent developments in economic and monetary union. Make one point. I, I don't think it, it was inevitable that the crisis in Europe had to be the crisis that we, we actually experienced. I mean, it was um, uh, an, uh, an extraordinary confl confluence of circumstances, as I say, not least of which was the, the collapse of, of uh, here, the Lehman Brothers, you know, which obviously precipitated the crisis. At that stage in Europe, we, we, we certainly in Ireland, knew we had a highly inflated uh, 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 property, uh, a speculative bubble. Uh, it was certainly our expectation that we were going to ease it out uh, over time and uh, be able to do that in a way that was successful and it wouldn't have caused the, 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 the crisis that, 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 that befell us. But I, I do think, I mean, obviously there were issues within the design of the currency, within the design of the management of the currency, which have now been and are being, uh, being addressed. But I don't think it was absolutely the case that it had to all unfold in this particular way. Uh, in, in the catastrophic way that it has unfolded. But, uh, so there was no uh, inevitability about it, no, but having said that, um, it did befall us, and the question was, how has Europe acquitted itself in the meantime in the management of that? And I don't think uh, in many ways that, that Europe gets the credit that it does, that, it, that maybe it deserves, um, you know, for managing a very, very powerless and uh, complex situation uh, in a context where you had the 17 countries in the, in, the, in the currency and the 27 countries over and beyond that. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think, you know, people, uh, Europe gets a very bad press and has got a, a, a truly bad press here over the last three years for what seemed like a very halting approach, a very uncertain approach, uh, and, and uh, you know, to, to the crisis. Um, but, but uh, you know, uh, cumulatively, the steps that we have taken, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, do amount to something that, that involves uh, a fundamental change uh, and we have got our act together, and all the more impressive when you think of the complexity of negotiating with 27 to say no, 17 to say nothing of 27 countries. So, um, you know, it would be, it would be a bit much to expect Europe day one of the crisis to be able to say, you know, to take its fingers and say problem solved. So we have had to feel our way forward. We had not got the instruments to solve this problem straight up, and so Europe in the meantime has had to create those instruments, 
uh, we, we, we believe that they, 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 they are in place or they are being put in place now in a way which hopefully uh, will avoid us having to endure a similar uh, catastrophe in the future. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but as I say, I don't think it was necessarily preordained that it had to be as big a crisis as it was 2009, 2010, um, were it not for the fact that, it, that the precipitation in many ways uh, originated from this side of the Atlantic. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. This is going to touch on foreign policy and then uh, open it up for questions from the audience. Um, the, the EU is said to be preparing a, uh, a Mideast peace initiative uh, where they would approach Israelis and Palestinians with proposal for a peace conference. Um, and my question is, is that, does that have any realistic hope of going somewhere without it having uh, U.S. participation or being, um, you know, something that the U.S. takes the lead on, in fact? Well, we, we've been dealing with this um, issue for a number of years. It's been extremely difficult. It is clear that it requires both Americans and Europeans to be heavily engaged and actively engaged, and that is the case as we speak. Um, and President Obama is preparing a visit to the region, and uh, Secretary Kerry is actively uh, preparing it, and we have, you know, Cathy Ashton, my most direct boss, the European Union uh, High Representative for Foreign Policy and Security, met Secretary Kerry very early in his uh, mandate in, in Washington. We had a good meeting with him, and uh, it's clear that uh, the U.S. is reviewing uh, its uh, uh, positions there, looking at uh, different options for, for actions, and we are working very close to be them. So replying directly to your question, yes, we need Europeans and Americans on board, mm -hmm. but each side re retains its autonomy and its creativity and its uh, I I capacity to initiate or contribute to uh, the, the solutions that are required. And certainly, we are very active on the European side. I cannot confirm uh, what you hinted at, but what I can guarantee is that all our leaders are, of course, very focused in contributing to solving and making progress in the Middle East peace process. Did you want to say anything? That's right. Um, so let's have questions from the audience, and remember to wait for the mic to get to you. Yes? Uh, the mic. <coughs> we have the microphones. <coughs> yes. Yes. Here. Mike is coming. I <laughs> am um, surprised that I need to ask about money. It wasn't what I expected. But um, I'd like to ask about, really, about corruption vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the EU and also Ireland. Uh, also what, sir? Ireland. Ireland. Uh, I was living in a new member state um, actually in the 90s in Eastern Europe. And great sums of money came during that time from the EU for all kinds of development projects. And uh, while some of that money was used uh, very well and wisely, a lot of that money was pocketed or misused in, in astonishing ways. So that was happening where I was, but I know it wasn't the only place that it was happening. So I'm thinking now about two things. One is how did the EU deal with this uh, perhaps oversight problem about how money was used actually from those wonderful grants that were available in the 1990s. And also since I think Ireland also um, had this problem and um, I wondered if that was dealt with within the country. If uh, I'm curious about populations in these countries and whether these issues were really raised and dealt with. Well, just if I may um, just um, uh, address the issue as far as it relates to, to Ireland. I mean, um, Ireland has been an, a major beneficiary of, of EU funding uh, since the very beginning. And in fact, um, Ireland um, continues to be a net uh, recipient of, of EU funding and will continue to be so um, I think right through to almost 2020. But in any event, what you're really referring to, I think, are structural funds, the cohesion funds, um, um, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I, t frankly, I'm not aware, uh, you know, of any suggestion uh, other than that Ireland, you know, was a country where this money was spent 
wisely, effectively. And in fact, in many ways, that Ireland was, for the most part, a model in terms of just the way in which this money could be uh, uh, spent in ways that you know, uh, created the transformation in our economy that did take place throughout those, those decades. So um, you know, of all the issues that have arisen in Ireland over, over, over the decades, um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not aware that there's been an issue relating to European monies, other than the kind of a general sense that they've been well-focused, well-spent, and to good effect. Well, in a more general way, um, I think there's a distinction, a clear distinction to be made between did we use the money in the, in the best possible way in terms of the output and the issue of corruption or fraudulent use of the money. Uh, as far as the second part is concerned, uh, all the, if you look at all the Court of Auditors reports, the European one and the national one, uh, you know, the level of irregular irregularities is, is pretty much the same. Uh, nationwide or uh, European-wide. Uh, so it's a pattern of irregularities in the use of public money that is, you know, average in, in Europe. We need, I'm not saying it's not important and serious to attack it, but it's not more important at European level than it is at national level. Second aspect is that uh, structural funds, EU money spent in a country, is a shared responsibility between the EU authorities and the national authorities. By the way, there is national money into it as well. There is uh, the principle of participation of the national budget. Uh, and so it's a shared responsibility of EU and national authorities. So I don't think that the issue of corruption is, is extremely important as compared to the general situation in our countries. A discussion could take place about the best use of the money. And I think what we're doing also as, out of, as part of our response to the crisis is to make sure that uh, money coming from the EU to countries like the ones you're referring to is used in the best possible way in order to enhance competitiveness. So we are very, we'll be very much focusing in the next cycle on uh, helping the, the economies to be more competitive. Uh, sometimes it requires infrastructure, sometimes it requires other kind of support. Uh, but that is the central discussion that is taking place right now. Yes. I'm Ronan McGovern from Ireland and MIT. I'd like to touch on the issue of an alliance between Europe and between America. In our lifetimes, this alliance will exist in a world that is shaped by a culture that's not our own, by a culture that is Asian, maybe later African, but not so much European or American anymore. And so my question is, what is the most important common ground in the European approach and the US approach? And what is the biggest difference in the European and the US approach in embracing these new cultures? That's one of yours, Joe. Well, good. Uh, I think our, the foundation for our cooperation, at least that's a, this is a personal remark, uh, the foundation of our cooperation uh, is our common values. What are our common values? I think democracy, individual freedom, human rights in general, the rule of law. This is the tolerance, respect for the other, you know, basic fundamental human values uh, is what unites the EU and the US. I'm not saying the others don't share it, but certainly we do share them, and I think this should be the foundation of our approach to, to global issues, be it economic, political, trade, otherwise. Now, we, we should not be arrogant in promoting and preserving these values. We have to accept difference and diversity, and maybe we can do better there in, if we go look back at our history. I think we need to be open to the outside world. We need to be open to incorporate new cultures. I think we are. Uh, our economies are the most open economies in the world. Our societies are the most open in the world. Uh, and we are fighting several battles around the world on, on freedom of expression, freedom of internet, freedom of speech, religion. This is, these are our common battles. So I think this is the way, uh, this is what it, this is the main foundation of our cooperation. 
And I don't see many differences on these issues between the EU and the US. You know, we may have an issue about death penalty, for instance, where, in fact, uh, you know, uh, some states in the US still recognize death penalty as a way to uh, fight crime. Uh, we are against death penalty. In Europe, it doesn't exist. And we have a good dialogue with America here. I, I, I write letters to governors every now and then uh, uh, promoting the case of people that are on, the, on death row. And uh, we continue to, to claim that this is not a good thing. And we ask the US to have a moratorium and all that. The debate is going on. This is one area in terms of fundamental rights where we still have a difference between Europe and, and the United States. Uh, but otherwise, we have a very vibrant dialogue on issues like uh, privacy and the relationship between privacy and security. Uh, and other areas in which we have slightly different cultural uh, approaches to the issue, uh, uh, which we need to engage and discuss and try to find common solutions. So this is uh, as far as I can go uh, in your very uh, far-reaching question that will take us maybe longer to, to develop. Natasha Babushkina, I'm a um, founder of Europeans in Boston. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I have a very easy question <laughs> to all. Uh, from all of the plans, forgive me if I move. Oh, oh, we need it. Okay, forgive yeah. me. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so the quick, easy question that I have from all of the future plans of EU, I understand the Balkan countries are the one to be considered in the future to be part of EU. With the Euro crisis, what would be the future plan? in five or ten years, which countries on, on your list? Joe, if you may. Yeah, Thank well, you. Yeah, the, well, the, uh, the Europe is, a, is, a, is a, a sequence of enlargements, right? We started with six, we are now 27, soon 28. So enlargement is, is part of our DNA. Uh, in, in when we started, our founding fathers said that we want an ever closer union, and a union that, of course, incorporates as many Europeans as possible. We have a number of criteria uh, that apply. Uh, and if countries are part of Europe and you know, uh, apply and reach the levels and the criteria that we've set ourselves, which are both economic and political, uh, they are likely to become members of the European Union. Uh, in, in, ge in geographical terms, this involves uh, everybody in Western Europe and, and the Balkans fundamentally. It includes Turkey as well. Uh, for the moment, it does not include, in terms of prospect of accession, countries like Ukraine or, or Belarus. And uh, other countries could think of joining, like Switzerland and, and Nor Norway. I hope they will one day, but that's up to them to, to, to decide. So basically, this, this, is, this is what we want to achieve. So as far as the Balkans is concerned, uh, we have one country, Slovenia, already there since 2004. We have another country about to join, Croatia, uh, hopefully in the coming months. But all the other countries of the Western Balkans are, have the vocation to become members of the European Union when and if they are ready to do so. There are different stages of development, as you know. Uh, Montenegro is already quite advanced. Other countries have to still to catch up. Uh, but there is one issue that I think we all agree. Uh, the prospect of European integration is the single most important driver of change, reform, reconciliation, progress in the Balkans. And I don't think we will ever abandon the Balkans. We will never let down on the Balkans, on the Balkan countries. We'll be there always to. Uh, reaffirm their European vocation, work with them to create the conditions for them to join as soon as possible. But basically, they have to do their homework, which is different kind of homework if you consider each of the countries. Uh, there's an issue of neighborhood relationship as well, as you well know. There's an issue of uh, reconciliation and solution of problems inherited from past conflicts. It's a very complex situation, uh, but uh, their place is in Europe. Uh, and we have to work together to make it happen. The euro area crisis, of course, you know, creates, as we discussed earlier, a certain degree of instability and, 
uh, in, in the European Union, but no one has challenged uh, the prospect of enlargement. Everybody remains committed to, to, to it. And it's very important that we celebrate the arrival of Croatia as, uh, as an illustration of the fact that the enlargement goes on. It's work in progress and it, it will continue. Can I, can I just say also that, I mean, um, it, it is very, very important, uh, you know, that, that, that people understand that the ambition of countries who are not currently um, in the European Union um, to become members of the European Union, that that ambition remains undiluted. Uh, not uh, notwithstanding, as I say, the, the, the crisis of the last number of years. So uh, whatever the issues that Europe uh, has had to face and is facing, uh, it hasn't diluted the, um, the ambition and the necessity for many of these countries, including in particular the Balkan, to, to be part of this European family. And I'm simply making the point that, you know, uh, to the extent that people might have ever suggested that the, uh, uh, the future of Europe or the Union was ever in doubt or the future of our currency was ever in doubt, all you really have to do is ask countries who are not currently in the Union and who aspire to be in the Union uh, whether they still want to be in the Union, and the answer is demonstrably yes. I want to, I want to ask a related question, which is on um, Turkey's application for membership. I saw a Turkish speaker the other day at Harvard. Uh, he was making a, an implausible case that Turkey could choose the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, instead of its alliance with the West. On the other hand, it seems perfectly right for him to say that uh, Turkey's been in line for a long time and uh, it's made all kinds of uh, democratic reforms and not being um, in encouraged has led to a kind of slowing down. So they have more journalists, generals and students and intellectuals in jail than any country in the world right now. Um, what are the chances that Turkey will eventually uh, be admitted in should it? Germany and France have both been very hostile. Of course, the economic um, graphs would indicate that it should be the European Union applying to gain entry into Turkey at this point. Um, but what, what are the chances? Well, uh, just for, b before Turkey, just to, to prolong a point made by Michael, I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, history of the Union, uh, I was talking about the sequence of enlargements, no country ever left the European Union. Many have joined the European Union. No country ever left the Euro area. Uh, more are lining up to join it. The latest in, 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 in our experience is Latvia, who's now confirming that they want to join the Euro next January. So both the enlargement of the Union or, and the enlargement of the Euro area is, is continuing, is progressing. Uh, and uh, you know, if you think of um, supply and demand, uh, this is a sign that the market is still there and there is still demand for the euro area and there's still demand for the European Union and we are very happy with that and we need to, as we just said, to uh, be very aware of uh, our responsibilities towards the countries that have the right to join and wish to join and are preparing to join. Uh, Turkey is one of them. There should be no doubts about it. Turkey is negotiating accession to the European Union, and the European Union is negotiating the accession of Turkey. Nothing stopped. No suspension, no questioning of that uh, project. It's an ongoing project. It's a difficult one, because Turkey is a big country, has some elements of specificity uh, that are very relevant. Uh, it's uh, geographic location, its dimension, uh, its uh, the strategic importance of Turkey in terms of uh, foreign policy, regional conflicts, energy security, migration, you name it, uh, makes it a very complex case. With all due respect, it's easier to have Croatia join the Union than it is to prepare for Turkish accession. Uh, but it has not been questioned in the sense of uh, suspending or stopping the process, not at all. There has been a debate, political debate, and that's only normal that that debate exists in Turkey, inside Turkey, and inside the European Union. We have had some difficult moments where, you know, people were expressing doubts. Uh, I see some interesting developments in the last few weeks 
in the sense of accelerating parts of the negotiation, so we will see. But it's clear that uh, it's a long-term process. It will not happen tomorrow or in the next couple of years. Uh, we all know that. But it is uh, a process that is important because of its final goal, as much as it is for the, the journey that we have to do together. You know, the changes and the reforms and the progress that needs to, to be made in order for the accession to be possible one day is equally important. And if you think of Turkey, uh, a number of changes have, have happened in Turkey because induced and provoked by the prospect of accession as much as in the Balkans. So it's very important that we keep the track that this provides uh, the stimulus for change in Turkey. And at one point we will have to assess the situation, whether or not we have fulfill the criteria, we have reached the, the level in which we can consider the accession of Turkey. Um, so that's where we are on this. But Turkey goes back to 1963, so a few years after the Union was created, Turkey was already an associated state uh, with the prospect of, uh, of accession. So it's a long-standing relationship we have with Turkey, it's a major partner of ours. Uh, the process is ongoing, it's a difficult one, it will take time. We need to focus on the changes required to have Turkey ready to come in, and we need to prepare the Union to accommodate Turkey. At one point in time, we will have to ask member states whether they are ready or not. Some have indicated that they will do that through a referendum, consul direct consultation of people, of course. These are major decisions. We'll, we'll see that when we get there. For the moment, we need to focus on the changes that are required in order to continue the, pro the process. Questions? Yes. I'd like to sharpen Alan's question. I'd like to add one of my own. Ambassador Collins, you're certainly right that once Ireland guaranteed to pay off all of the creditors of the Irish private banks, you didn't have much choice but to implement austerity. But in retrospect, would you have been better off defaulting and not paying back some of the German and other continental banks the way Cyprus seems to be considering not paying off the Russian oligarchs? And Ambassador Valley d'Almeida, uh, Alan's question was about the austerity that the countries which do have a choice are implementing and the uh, effect it has on populism and xenophobia and strange political developments that might not be in the EU's long-run interest and so the question, not for Ireland, which sort of made its choice under a lot of duress in 2009, but the question is, should Germany ease up and maybe have a little bit more stimulus and not be quite so harsh with the, its votes in the ECB to allow the Eurozone to grow faster as a whole? After all, Germany's doing pretty well, low inflation, low unemployment, but the, your country and the other uh, Mediterranean countries are under extreme economic pressure and extreme political pressure too, would the EU be better off if Germany didn't impose such austerity on the southern countries and allowed more stimulus in the core countries, if I can use that word to exclude Ireland? What say, core. core or poor? Core. 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 <laughs> and then, is, those are pretty easy questions. Okay. So let me ask another one. Can you imagine free trade in agricultural products between the EU and the U.S. in our lifetimes? You, us old men. Well, I, I'll take the first one. You can take the second too, Joe. Okay. <laughs> um, would we have been better off to, you know, uh, back in 2000 and um, I suppose 2008? I can't remember now exactly when uh, uh, to have defaulted and. Um, uh, uh, gone the route, perhaps uh, that that has uh, that that Iceland went. Uh, um, you know, uh, this debate in Ireland goes on, right? I mean, that was a very very controversial uh, decision. There's no uh, two ways about that. And uh, uh, you know, what was the right thing to have done, and uh, whether this was uh, a wise thing to do in the circumstances. Uh, you know, to some extent, and you know, to every extent, that's water under the bridge. I mean, we did it. And, uh, and we, we are now in the business of retooling and re-engineering what we did, um, you know, with no, uh, no, no desire to default uh, on anybody. I mean, so one of the great credits that Ireland has gained has been 
um, has been, um, you know, you know, living up to our responsibilities, living up to our commitments, however painful they were, and paying our way essentially. No matter, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a view that everybody uh, w would agree that, 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 that we, you know, we, we shouldn't have gone the way of, of, of something like like Iceland. But that's the ch that's the path we chose, uh, and um, I'd say the, the challenge for us now is to ease that path and to maybe just reconstruct that path uh, to such that uh, the burden is, is, is lessened. And we're already uh, achieving some success there. We, one of the elements that was involved uh, with the retooling of our banks was, was the so-called promissory note uh, to do with Anglo-Irish Bank, which is one of the biggest banks that, that collapsed. And we just got a deal in relation to that last, um, in the last month, which involves a saving for us an in, not inconsiderable saving of about a billion a year, billion billion euros a year, which is not inconsiderable. Just overnight, uh, we have agreement by the euro, the eurozone, and the European partners at, at the uh, European finance ministers uh, to look at at, at re-engineering another part of that debt, which will push the debt out uh, over a number of of, of of further years, which will attenuate it and maybe ease the burden, particularly at a time when we're coming back into the bond market, so that you won't get. Uh, a big repayment schedule uh, due between now and um, and the next few years, which causes problems in the bond market as we seek to re-enter. So, uh, you know, there will be books, there will be theses, there will be everything written about that. People will compare what, Gre or what, what, what Iceland did and what Ireland did, who was right, who was wrong. We believe, uh, you know, that, that, um, that, that in the end of the day, you know, that, 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 that's a worthy study, but we have chosen the path that we're on. It's a path that obviously we're, we're seeking to ameliorate now uh, uh, and obviously, uh, we do believe at the end of the day uh, that the, the consequences of, of, of the path that we have chosen you know, has demonstrate, demonstrated Ireland as, as a country, however painful, uh, as a country which keeps its word, uh, which honours its commitments, and which fulfils all its obligations under the bailout package as well. So uh, I say uh, that's not to say people are happy, uh, that's not to say that the pain hasn't been severe, uh, but uh, we hope at the end of the day that, we very much hope at the end of the day, that this would this would pay a dividend, uh, in some way, uh, that will will cause us to um, to regain our footing and to and to uh, achieve uh, uh, growth uh, and prosperity. On your second question, yes, I I, I can envisage uh, uh, an open market on agriculture uh, in the years to come. I, I why not? I mean, if we have the the, the willingness to do that. It's certainly possible. Uh, in some areas, it will be more dif difficult than others. It may not happen overnight, but I think it's the, in the overall interest of our economies to open up and to find ways to accommodate our sectoral interests with uh, a more general, general interest of promoting growth and jobs in our two economies. The negotiations will cover that as well. Let's see how much we can obtain. In the preparatory phase that we had in the last year or so, we looked at all these problems, and I think there was enough confidence on both sides that we could engage in a negotiation, but I cannot prejudge the final result. What I see is that what is, uh, what is at stake in this agreement is so important that we should try in every area, every sector, to go as far as we can. On your first question, I, I cannot agree with the assumptions implicit in your question. Um, what I can say is that we are in countries in the southern rim of Europe uh, doing an impressive effort, and I have to respect the sacrifice of uh, the people in these countries, uh, and because I respect that sacrifice, I need to say very clearly that this reform is necessary, that I didn't see a major alternative to it, that is, it has to be carried out in the best possible way. I noticed that in the last months uh, and even weeks, uh, uh, decisions have been taken that uh, modulate the effort, and that certainly everybody welcomes that. But fundamentally, the principle that the countries need to adjust, need to reform, need to modernize, is absolutely critical for the success of this uh, operation. So. Um, that's as far as I can go in replying to your interesting question uh, on this topic. Well, I want to thank uh, both uh, both ambassadors and, and, and the audience for asking their probing questions. Um, and I hope that, that uh, this has been an informative uh, way of understanding the problems of the European Union. Thank you. <laughs>